Austin Basis is on this season, the final season of the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. And I can't wait to get into all things Maisel and some other stuff. But uh, thanks so much, Austin, for coming on the Hot Morning Show with Becca and Mike D. Oh, thanks for having me, Becca. I already got through the three episodes that Prime has allowed us. And we are introduced to you in a very big way in episode two. You play Alvin. Is it safe to say you're the head writer? Yes, I am the uh, I am the head writer. I'm the joke. Uh, I would I would say I'm the joke bouncer. It's a good. So, that's a, yes, that's a good way to put it. I check the joke IDs and see if they're they're funny um, or if they're if they're outdated or. Um, and I I think I I know my character knows what Gordon likes, and that's more important than if a joke's actually just funny. It, it has to be funny coming out of his mouth and it has to pass his test. So um, I'm, I'm basing all my judgment on that. And so um, yes, head writer, I'm the joke doctor. Um, yeah. I like to think I make jokes better and uh, pitch them in a way that Gordon will like them. Alvin's like the Gordon vibe check guy. Yeah, totally. Totally. That's what I get from it. Now, prior to, being on the set of the marvelous Mrs. Maisel, had you watched the show? Were you familiar? Oh yeah, I was a huge fan of the show. That's why that that's why I was like sought out this audition. Uh, I helped a friend in in New Jersey audition. You know, he's a local New York guy, and I'm like, I'm reading this part. I'm reading Alvin. I'm reading all the other roles to help him audition, and I'm like, this is like my this is my wheelhouse. This is New York you know, kind of Jewish comedy guy. And I'm like, I love the maze. I love Maisel. Um, I told, I've told people that Shirley is basically all my aunts on my mom's side of the family. Did they sound like Shirley? <laughs> what? Did they sound like her? They're exactly like a couple of them were just exactly like Shirley. Like they had cracker sandwiches Lee. in their purses. Oh yes. My, my grandma, my, my grandma Lee, my mom's mother, uh used to carry a plastic bag inside her purse and take the sweet and low yep. um uh my uncle also said he she once took salt and pepper shakers i believe it i have a, i have a grandma similar yes yeah um there was a restaurant i think it was like called the roadhouse or something where they instead of like bread they would have peanuts you know, and then like you crack the peanuts and put it on the floor. Um, so when they lived in Florida, she would go and take peanuts so that we could take it back on the plane with us <laughs> and put like just dump the thing of peanuts. And the waitress would come over and like, you're done with the peanuts already. And sure enough, she has like this bag and she would give us these peanut bags to take home. Those are those are the most valuable people because they will always have snacks and they will always have uh, free sweet and lows, like you said. I want to go back to your friend. Did they? Did your friend land the part that he was auditioning for? No, unfortunately, it was like one of those. It's always a, a touchy thing because I wasn't going out for the part he was auditioning for. Um, he's actually a great guy. He's one of my co-writers on this comic book series that I've been doing. He's also the artist too. So, um, but he, you know, we did improv and sketch comedy back in New York together, and. <clears throat> he was just auditioning and he's like, you know, you want to work on it with me? And I'm, re you know, I asked him, I'm like, do I, I'm not going out for your role. Um, would you let me reach out to my agent, see if I can get an audition and send in a tape from LA. Um, and he was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I felt bad because they cast like <laughs> in the role he, he auditioned for, they cast Eddie K Thomas. So a name actor already. So, um, it, uh, he was kind of up against it there. So, um, so busy. he was happy for you though. I'm sure. Oh yeah. He's yeah. He was really happy. Really happy for me. I got to hang out with him too. Cause I was in New York for eight months. No, I want to go back to that. You're from Brooklyn originally. So did this feel like a homecoming? Completely, completely. Um, you know, the show is set in New York, but it's set kind of like when my parents were coming up in New York in this late fifties, early sixties. Um, actually more my dad, because, my mom, you know, she was she was born in 49. So mm -hmm. she was young then, you know, she was like Esther. Um, right, right, uh, right. Uh, but, 
yeah, like it was really a homecoming in a way that I didn't, you know, I'd done films in New York. Uh, I had done some shows, you know, a couple of days here and a couple of days there. And I visited a lot since I'd left. Um, but most of the people I know had moved out either in Jersey, you know, can Connecticut, Florida. Um, and so of the people that were still there, I was able to see my friends kind of see, you know, kind of live in different neighborhoods that I hadn't like been familiar with when I grew up. Cause I was a South Brooklyn guy. I grew up in Coney mm -hmm. Island, um, in Seagate. And, uh, and so that's a very remote area of, it's like the last stop on the, the train, on the train um, yep. you know, last season in, in Maisel, they did a Coney Island episode. Uh, I was like, Hey, um, but it was a real homecoming, a, a way to kind of really just hang and be in, in the place that I grew up in and be working as an adult. Um, it was, it was definitely a, a bonus of, of getting on the show. Austin, that dialogue uh, is really snappy. I, there's really not a lot of other words to describe it. It's so fast paced. What is it like working in an environment like that? Well, as an actor, when you, you know, kind of work on memorizing lines and you work on dialogue, there's something called the speed through that a lot of times if you're doing a play. Um, so like when I was doing theater in New York before I moved out to L.A., um, and you're getting ready for a performance. You don't want to do the whole thing and full out and do all the emotional aspects, especially if it's a drama, you know, or even a comedy, but um, it, you would do a speed through. So if it was like, you know, a 20 minute play or a, a half hour play, the speed through would be a third of that. You would just go as fast as you can and you do it to memorize lines and to kind of like, you know, just be in touch with the other actor. Right. And you do that as, as a, as a practice when you're auditioning for stuff. So um, on Maisel, the speed through is the through. It is the, it is the thing, you know? Um, there's an old thing, uh, old saying, a direction, if you want to make it, you know, uh, better, like people say faster, louder, funnier, that, you know, if you say it faster and you say it louder, it's going to be funnier. Um, and in Maisel, that's true because the writing is so good. And when the writing's so good and it's so rhythmic and it's so, um, what would you say, snazzy, snappy? Snappy, um, like fast-paced and yeah, just like right. quick, quick, quick. Yeah, it, there is a rhythm to it. It's almost like a beat of the beat of a song. And if you miss or skip a beat, it doesn't work. Um, and they'll keep going and we'll do it as many times as it takes to get it perfect. Um, because it, it is written specifically, you know, like word perfect. There's no improv. You say every word, every single syllable. Um, and it's meant to work in a flow in a certain way, like a song. It's funny. Uh, so my husband watches the show in and out. He's kind of like a, a fly buyer. Um, we sort of watch TV like that often. Yeah. And so he sat down and, and watched a couple episodes with me. Uh, the last, the, or I would say episode two and three last night. And we were sort of laughing about, how what was funny back then is so much more wholesome and like they thought they were pushing the envelope compared to today's comedy which is so different uh so if you could kind of speak to that and speak to the writing a little bit more about how those jokes were very of the time well i think the the writer's room on the gordon ford show plays a, a very interesting role in that like dynamic because when you're talking about Midge and Susie and Lenny Bruce, you're talking about uh, comics that were pushing the limits of mm. what you can get away with on stage and, and the blue comedy of the time. And when you're talking about like Gordon Ford, he plays to the cornfields, as he said, you yeah. know, and in the same way, network television is, is a similar thing. You can't curse. There's certain like, you know, um, restrictions. So the challenge with us who in a writer's room in that time, we're still crazy body, you know, uh, individuals who curse, but we also have to create jokes within the context of a TV show. Um, and that would get past the censors. Um, and so, um, I think it's a challenge more for Midge, 
not just getting in as a female into an all male writer's room, uh, which was a very rare thing in those days, even though it happened. Um, but she also has to tone down her, her humor because in a, in a way her humor is unlimited. It's just, she talks about anything and everything and she uses whatever language does the trick and serves the purpose. And so I feel like to a degree, it's more of a challenge for Midge. Mm. Um, and it plays a nice balance because she has to come up with jokes that don't have profanity or, you know, crossing the line, you know, any, any reference to scatological or sexual humor, um, especially in that day and age. And I also, uh, really quick before I, I we get into the final season of it all as an actor you've done you you have a crazy credit list and I mean you've done both streaming and network because you just mentioned the whole network tv thing do you have a preference as to not only how you act but also how you consume the products do you do you do you prefer one over the other I guess I I think you know to a degree I I feel like I consume more streaming and premium cable stuff just because I just feel like it's more adult and more, um, more realistic, mm. uh, you know, whether it's the, you know, cinematography, the language, the, you know, the graphic nature of either the violence or the sexual content, it's like just more real. Um, and especially when you're in these crazy situations, whether it's, you know, the show you or Ozark or like Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones, you know, from fantasy to like realism, any one of those things, you know, like even the the more normal shows where it's just familial, like, you know, a family trying to make it in this world um, or a person. It, to me, that's something I relate to more, you know, in a, in a way I relate to more independent film than like you know big blockbuster Marvel. action type of movies because they're going to tell a truer story and as an actor that's what i want to do i want to tell you know truer stories but in in a way that balance humor and the drama because anytime you you know probably in providence same way in brooklyn it's like you have drama you know someone's going to make some jokes you got to break the tension somehow um you know, like I'm not one to like shows that just have jokes, like multi-camera sitcoms that are like every third line is a joke because most of those jokes aren't going to be funny. Right. But if you have a show like Maisel or Ted Lasso that has a heart and then, at you know, once you're like pulled into the poignancy of it, you know, it, it gets you with a belly laugh or, you know, like as Susie's walk in the room, she says, F you, yeah. you know, um, that to me is, is the best kind of stuff and the stuff that I like to watch and I want to be a part of most. And I respect that. I can totally see that. Lastly, what was the vibe on set? I mean, this is the fifth and final season. So what was your experience being part of something that is so not only iconic, but in its final season? Yeah. I mean, I felt lucky, privileged, and and was surprised to find that most people that are on the set and and whether you're a background actor, a crew member, or one of the regular actors who's already won multiple awards for it, everyone respected everyone else because of the quality of the contribution, you know, from the props department to the set production design to the set decoration to the choreography, the music, they have original music that are, that's, you know, made for the show, the costumes. I don't have to say that it's like the most elaborate mm -hmm. and most beautiful, you know, costume department I've been a part of, you know, I think everyone was, they were just, it was just, they were like living the last days of a dream. And um, I and the rest of the writers and the newer characters were welcomed in as part of that dream, as opposed to, um, you know, this is our dream and you get to just, you know, enjoy it with us and watch us from the outside. 
they brought us in and specifically Rachel was very welcoming and warm, you know, in addition to being extremely talented and versatile, um, it, you know, that aspect of it made us feel like we were part of it, you know, um, when we were just joining at the very last, you know, couple of, a uh, couple of episodes, you know, even though, you know, we're on the season, but it's like, it, it's still, um, yeah, it's still that, like, I, I guess it was a little more emotional towards the end, the last mm -hmm. table read, the last day of shooting, um, cause everyone was there and it was just like, you could see how much, uh, and how much of a special time it was for them. And of course it was special for us, but it was only special for eight months, not six years. True. The Gordon Ford writer's room is such a wonderful addition to, to the show. I love uh, the advancement of it. I love how it advances, it advances the show. And uh, I'm excited to see what Alvin does and the rest of the writer's room and where the show goes. It's so interesting to see what they did with the whole flash forward thing. Uh, and I did not see that coming. I don't know if it had yeah. been in the press a lot either. Yeah, that I think that specifically they did not want to uh, let people in because it's a, you know, it's a risk. It's a departure from what the show is. It's not a, you know, it's not always like Breaking Bad always let off the whole opening, the cold open of every episode was a future time. Yeah. And then you would cut back to before that leading up to that. You know, there's a lot of shows. NCIS does that. You know, you see a clip. And then you're like, how did that happen? What's what's that? And then you lead all the way up to that. Um, and I think that was their way of telling the complete story, like telling, you know, the story, you know, into the future of what came of these, you know, honestly, what came of all the characters, but the two women at the center of it, which are Susie and Midge, um, and, and how they're, careers and relationship survived or didn't throughout the course of the next however many years they go into it's brilliant if you think about it because now all i want to know is why they stopped being friends or whatever the line was yeah oh and then their friendship broke apart and it really yep. zeroes you in on that uh austin thank you so much this was such a pleasure i'm so excited about the rest of the season and i appreciate you taking the time talking to me and thank you for having me. It's uh it's a uh, it was fun talking with you.